Thank you. Tonight on Talking Politics, it's been two years since Massachusetts passed a landmark police reform law spurred by a nationwide wave of outrage over the murder of George Floyd. Later in the show, we'll take stock of what's changed since the law went on the books and what still needs to be done. Two legislative architects of that law and the head of the Boston branch of the NAACP will join me on those questions. First, though, this week, the Boston Globe reported that Boston Mayor Michelle Wu is about to roll out her long-awaited plan to limit rent increases in that city. In and of itself, that's no surprise. Back in 2021, when Wu won big in Boston's historic mayoral race, her support of rent control was one of her signature policy positions. But when Wu's formal proposal is finally released, maybe next week in her State of the City speech, it's going to kick off an intense, high-stakes battle featuring Boston City Hall, legislative leaders on Beacon Hill, and Democratic Governor Maura Healey, not to mention a host of other parties deeply invested in keeping rent control from returning to Boston, maybe other communities communities. Joining me now to talk about Wu's plan, the reaction it's already listening, and what's going to come next are my colleagues Soraya Wintersmith, GBH News' City Hall reporter, and Peter Kadzis, our senior political editor. Good to see you both. Soraya, what are the most important parts of the leaked plan, which is not necessarily the final plan? The things that we got from the Boston Globe this week are rates of increase, exemptions, and some details about eviction protections. We learned that landlords will be able to increase rent um, at the rate of inflation plus 6%, but that would have a hard cap at 10%, so never more than 10% total. We learned that small landlords or those that live sort of in their multifamily units will get an exemption along with buildings that have been open for less than 15 years. Hmm. And then we learned that there will be some rules around eviction so that landlords can't just kick out people who don't have leases for no reason. Two other things that we learned that were not from the Boston Globe were that it will have a um, decontrol aspect, meaning that rent will go back to market rate in between tenants. Oh, interesting. Yep, and that it will apply to about 56% of Boston's rental housing stock. Excellent. Thank you for that overview. Peter Kadzis, a couple hours after the Globe's report, the Greater Boston Real Estate Board put out a statement panning rent control. I'll just read a tiny bit. Rent control is a failed policy solution that won't help the dire need to create housing in Boston and across the Commonwealth. Went on to say it'll decrease production of new units, and it noted the statement that Boston had, I believe, the lowest number of units permitted last year in almost a decade. Is the real estate industry, along with the housing industry, going to be in the vanguard when it comes to opposing whatever rent control proposal Wu puts forth? Uh, yes, they'll be in the vanguard, I think, especially in Boston, one that's before the city council. I think uh, if it passes the council, and I think some form of rent control will pass the council, and it goes up to the state house, that's when uh, all heck breaks loose. I mean, you'll have... Uh, uh, I think, heavy I union involvement. I mean... Because the unions want their people to have jobs building, right? They're worried they're rent control it. is not just about affordable housing for people to live in. It's also part of a larger housing construction strategy. And the entire state of Massachusetts doesn't have enough housing. If Boston cuts... If, if because of rent control, housing construction stops or mm -hmm. slows in Boston, that's bad news for the state. Soraya, uh, you were nodding there when Peter was talking about the production piece of this. I'm wondering what the people who would make a plan come out of City Hall, which Peter said he thinks is going to happen ultimately in some form, what are uh, the city councilors will be instrumental in that saying about Wu's plan? My sense from most folks in City Hall is that they really want to wait. Uh, we don't have anything on paper yet. This is just an opening stance. And I think most people understand that Mayor Wu is someone that's open to negotiation, and so things likely will change before we get mm -hmm. a proposal on paper, and then from there, they'll go back and forth. But we've heard people say that the cost of inflation, or the rate of inflation plus 6% is too high. Yeah. We've heard people say that they have a firm stance against rent control. You could probably guess the people who are firmly against it because they don't think it's good for the city. And then you've got folks in the middle saying if you can guarantee certain exemptions or certain other aspects of rental regulation, they might be brought on. But 
everybody understands it's it's a negotiation. So that's the characterization of where City Hall insiders and, and uh, other interested parties stand on this. You just did a story with Peter as your editor talking about the, you pull back the curtain on the public feedback that the city has been getting, that the Wu administration has been getting as they explore this possibility. What did you find in terms of what people are saying about this idea, broadly speaking? We were really trying to gauge what people were saying about the policy before we learned these bits and pieces. And um, there is a prevailing sense among some that because the mayor campaigned and made an endorsement of rent control, that a vote for her was also a vote for rent control. And the comments that we foia'd showed that it's really controversial even before we saw the pieces. Uh, it was almost a 40-40% split on hmm. each side. The thing that I really love, and a thing that I really love about Boston, is that you can ask people a question about a certain policy, and you'll get the people who say, yes, I'm for this, and no, I'm not for this, but you also get this bucket of people who say, don't forget about this thing, and don't forget about this other thing. So the mayor had no shortage of other ways suggestions of other ways to alter a policy from those public comments. So far, though, based on what you found, something of an even split something when it comes to yay split. or nay. Okay, Peter, that reminds me of, I believe, the 1994 ballot question, which ended up banning rent control statewide, passed by a very narrow margin. Um, I want to just double check here. I think it was 51 to 49 yeah. percent. Voters said, we want to do away with this. How important is the fate of Boston's plan, whatever it is, when it gets to the state house, when it comes to other municipalities, Massachusetts may be thinking about doing something similar here? Oh, hugely important. I mean, Soraya was taught, has been trying to get different mayors from around the state to comment on it. I've made some attempts to see how people on the Worcester City Council feel about it. No one wants to say nothing until... <laughs> this Boston plan gets going. Um, if rent control, it's a long shot. Rent control at the moment is a long shot. Um, but it's the first time in years it's even had a shot. Um, if people could compromise their way to a Boston plan, I think you would see it spread around the state. All right, Peter Kadzis, Soraya Wintersmith. Thank you both, and we should do this again, talking about this issue. Thanks. Next up, on the last day of 2020, Governor Charlie Baker signed a sweeping set of police reform measures into law. The reforms were the result of months of negotiations in the state legislature, prompted by a summer of mass protests that followed the murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis police officer. The law created a Peace Officer Standards and Training, or POST Commission, a civilian-led oversight board that certifies and can decertify officers across the state. It also banned racial profiling, chokeholds, tear gas on large demonstrations, and most no-knock warrants. In the two years since it was passed, how has the law changed policing in Massachusetts? I'm joined now by two lawmakers who were key in the bill's passage, State Representative Russell Holmes and former State Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz, and by Tanisha Sullivan, the president of the Boston branch of the NAACP. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Uh, Russell Holmes, let me start with you. This is, as I alluded to, a great big law with a whole bunch of constituent parts as one of the law's prime movers, the prime movers behind it. Give me two or three to your mind of the really important things that the law does or is intended to do. So Adam, I think from my perspective, it's not just about the law, it's about the cultural change that had to happen between police and community. And so the law, the way I see it, reset the playing field. I think there was just way too much of the advantage to police. And so as I look at it, it has reset it. It has made it so that the community now feels like they can be engaged. But it's also unfortunately put, I think, some police on their heels. I literally believe sometimes police are using the excuse of post and all the things they cannot do now to say, hey, we're going to only respond to community when they call us, not just being proactive and being positive. Oh, that's interesting. That's, is that something that you've picked up on just through communications with constituents? Have you experienced it yourself directly? No, I sit in many, many neighborhood meetings, and literally I hear uh, the, the chatter going back and forth. My community is still saying, we want to see you. We still want to make sure we're well protected. We're still the ones who... Are, seeing much of this violence. And then I hear folks say, well, we're not there because of the fact that we feel like there's a movement, basically, Black Lives Matter, we're not appreciated, we're not wanted. So I'm literally hearing that discussion between police and community often. Okay, so cultural reset that remains very much a work in progress, and hopefully we can double back to... Second thing would be yeah. the actual culture that reset that says, hey, 
we have now taken licenses. You wouldn't believe how many phone calls I got from people saying, hey, I know you're going to take the fact that I'm, I have no longer have arrest powers. And I'm like, wait a minute, I didn't even know you had arrest powers. So folks like even the, the, the folks who are riding, riding the horses in the park, I didn't know a park ranger I had didn't that, know that power. Either. And so um, that just reset also to just say the folks who should have these licenses and have arrest powers, that is going to also change the culture that's going to happen between police and community. Sonia Chang Diaz, I'd love to get your one or two or maybe three really important pieces of law. Oh, it's hard to pick. It was a big law, as you said. I think, you know, I, I think of this law in, in sort of buckets, right? And I think the big things that, that the law did with lots of parts in, in those buckets was one shift power, as Russell alluded to. Um, the, this is the first time among the 50 states that any state has ever had a police oversight body that both has real community representation on it and has real power, subpoena power, power to certify and decertify, power to set actual you know, binding regulations. So shifting power is a huge uh, marker of this bill. Um, also sort of shifting the way that we conceptualize the work of policing um, and public safety um, from just sort of force and punishment to um, prevention and uplift, right? The bill shifts resources. For example, it took away the requirement, what used to be a legal requirement, that schools in Massachusetts must have police officers and made that a local decision about whether, you know, yeah. what was best for schools. And then, you know, setting up um, proactive responsibilities and duties in law enforcement to um, prevent, to de-escalate, um, to intervene, right, if an officer sees a, a fellow officer abusing power. Um, all those sort of proactive responsibilities, I think, was a big shift as well. And that, incidentally, to me, when I was reviewing what's in the law, that is such a, the duty to intervene is such yeah. a huge conceptual shift, mm -hmm. especially, you know, with the murder of George Floyd fresh in everyone's mind. Mm -hmm. Tanisha Sullivan, I'd love to get your take as someone who's very active on these issues but is not legislating inside the building. Do you feel like the reforms that Sonia and Russell have mentioned and the other ones that they haven't, are they uh, fully implemented yet? Are they a reality yet? Or do they remain aspirational to a large extent? I think what's really important for us to make sure we acknowledge is the important role that community and protest play yeah. and played in us being able to even advance what is now historic legislation in Massachusetts. The fact is, I, I don't believe we would be here but for, quite frankly, the tragic murder of George Floyd and the protests in the streets yeah. that really really drove the energy around getting this done. Um, and so, you know, so I celebrate certainly and acknowledge those advocates and activists on the ground. But whenever we have public policy, I think it's important to look at the phases as well. There's oftentimes a problem that leads to protest that then leads to policy. But ultimately, we do want to get to practice and implementation. Mm -hmm. And on that front, that's the phase we're currently in. We do have more work to do. But I think it's also important for us to give the, um, those who have now been charged with implementing this work the time and the resource support to get it right. Um, you know, we need to make sure that as we are, as, as the work of post um, is being implemented and we're going through that certification and decertification process, that it is done um, with great intentionality and that we are ensuring that it is inclusive of certainly uh, everyday people voice, so that's the civilians, mm -hmm. right? Um, as well as law enforcement. I think it's important for us to do that in partnership. And, um, and I do believe here in Massachusetts, we've demonstrated that that's possible. The second point I wanna make here is that when it comes to this particular piece of legislation, as well as some of the other policy advancements, you know, the work that we did in Boston, yep. for example, um, that it was done in a very inclusive way. I think it's important for us to remember that this wasn't just about black and brown communities, right, in isolation, but it, we also, there were members of law enforcement who were very supportive of this work. I remember seeing you and your colleagues who were working on it in Boston standing up there, and there was a really wide range of people represented. Absolutely, and at the state level. We also saw the business community um, lean in um, on, um, on policing reform as well. And so here in Massachusetts, we did see something very unique in advancing this legislation. And what I want to call out is that it was inclusive 
Um, and I'm hopeful that as we continue to implement and operationalize it, that it will continue to be an inclusive process and one that leads to increased public safety. I want to talk a little more about implementation. And because I'm a member of the media, I want to focus on the negative for a little bit after sure. you guys have focused on, <laughs> on the positive. Um, the Post Commission, tell me if I've got this right, is supposed to make public disciplinary records yes. for police departments across the yes. state. But my coworker here at GBH News, Sarah Betancourt, she's reported on this, as have others, and she's pointed out in the story I was reading yesterday that if you go to the Post Commission website, those disciplinary records are not there. Correct. Why not? I have my answer. Um, well, let's start with you. <laughs> so, I, it's real simple. I'm a financial planner. Uh, attorney Sullivan's an attorney. You can literally go on to FINRA and see anything in my background. You can see the same thing in, in the attorney's background. And so what we heard often when we're having these discussions, when Sonia was talking about everyone being involved, is that the police says we're the most professional or the most trained police officers there are in the country. Mm -hmm. Why you need to uh, talk to us? Well, you're not the most professional because all of us, the rest of us professionals, can go through that background check. And so this piece, which is something that this, that the speaker and the leadership team fought me hard on. Literally, I said, no, I'm not ready to pass the bill until you get this language back in the bill. You must have it so that we can go and do this background check. I've talked to commissioners on the post commission. They are close, is what they keep telling me. Mm -hmm. We're close to getting this done, mm -hmm. but um, it is a, it's the part that they feel like their privacy rights are gonna be violated. The police yes. feel yes. like it. Mm -hmm. And so I understand that, that part, but Again, this is that shifting of power. They need to also be, if you have the right to put your arms behind my back, you should also have the right to have it so that you've done something in the past I need to know about. And it. my recollection is that the commission said they were getting close on this last summer. Sure they right? did. So they've been getting close for a little while. Yes. yes. Yeah, but they're building a whole new system. I mean, let's 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 be fair in this process too, right? Like a whole new system is being built and that requires resourcing. And so while again, we want to make sure that we get to the implementation phase, I also believe we've got to make sure if there if we're not moving as quickly as we'd like to, then the question becomes have we resourced it well enough? Are there enough people there mm -hmm. to actually get the thousands upon thousands of records into this system yep. so that they are searchable. So that that's a piece of this as well. Mm -hmm. uh, They're sending up a whole new agency, mm -hmm. you know. So I, you know, I think that the 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 magic is finding the balance point here, yeah, right? right? I remember Russell being so, you know, dogged and uh, clear in his standard. You know, when I when I get pulled over by a police officer, <laughs> while he's looking up my driver's license, I want to be able to look up, exactly you know. My yeah. rule. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it's not a matter of choice for the post, right? This is a matter of statute. It's in the law, yeah. in black and white, that uh, it is a requirement that the post make available when there's a substantiated uh, finding, right, of. Uh, misconduct, abuse of power, mm -hmm. a, a, training, a retraining requirement, certainly a decertification, that those records have to be available to the public. So, you know, the, the balance point will be, you know, do we see evidence that the Post is acting in good faith right. in getting there? Let me ask about another uh, matter involving Post disclosure. Well, I shouldn't say disclosure, more Post standards. Again, my colleague Sarah Betancourt reported that when the Post Commission released the names of thousands of officers earlier this, uh, actually I should say last year, mm -hmm. who had been uh, certified by the Commission, there were 10 officers from the Boston Police Department who were certified even though they had had complaints against them upheld, including the use of force uh, and conduct unbecoming. So my broad question for the three of you, hooked to that observation from Sarah is, are the criteria for certification as rigorous as they need to be or not? So. I I'm sorry to keep Hop on in. But take, taking it first, but when, I, when, when we were talking about who's going to be in the commission, right, mm -hmm. I remember saying to, to Larry, not Larry Ellison, the other Larry, uh, hey, Larry, Tom, okay. Oh, thank you. I was thinking. I was saying, Larry, mm -hmm. we can't, if you want us to have confidence. He's the president of the Boston Police, Police Department. Yes. Yeah. You have told me you don't want bad officers. You've told me that. So if that is the case, and you have to, I have to be able to trust that you're going to vote against even the officers when they come in and they have a problem. And so they, they went through the 10, they've gone through the 10,000, the first set, and now they're finally getting through these hearings where I think they're gonna to continue to decertify like the 15 they did last week. I guess, yep. again, they have to continue to just go through the process and I think that's why they landed there initially. Mm -hmm. I remember saying to Charlie, hey, who I wanted to go through the process first were all the people who had disciplinary problems in the past and then we didn't land there. We, Sonia was in that meeting where we were saying, hey, 
fine, we're going to do this A through H or whatever it is it, initially because it goes across mm -hmm. the entire state. I agree with, with Attorney Sullivan. Let's go through the process. Let's get them decertified and let the chips fall where they may in the I'm, next three I'm years. I'm glad you mentioned the 15 decertifications yeah. that were announced last week. And I, I believe that number is now up to 18, Correct. although I don't think that the three who've been added to the 15 original ones, we don't know their names or, or places. Not yet. yet. I, I think each of you may have wanted to hop in on the standards question. I, so I want to pick up what um, Tanisha was saying earlier, and this is so mm -hmm. important, cannot be overstated, um, the, the impact that uh, the community protests had, it was not a coincidence, right, that we passed this yeah, bill yeah. in 2020. It was a direct result of the of the outcry. And the work has to remain. And it's that's not easy, right? Most of these organizations, God bless them, are all volunteer. Yep. Tanisha's not getting paid for her right. work at the NAACP. <laughs> that's right. Um, and, and, you know, when I said that the Post is the first in the nation uh, of the 50 states to be, you know, have both real power and community voice, that's true, but it's not all community voice, right? It's right. not all to Tanisha Sullivan's on that post-governing board. It's also a lot of representation from the law enforcement community. And we fought hard, negotiated very hard to make sure that it was majority civilian. Yeah. Um, and that's a key. Um, but we needed to continue to have that community voice at the table participating, looking at those draft regulations, mm -hmm. giving public comment, pushing to make sure that they're rigorous um, so that the post continues to hold public trust as a, as a civilian regulator. You've brought up the issue of political will, and I want to ask a little more about that. But before we do, when I floated the question whether the standards for certification are as rigorous as they should be, mm -hmm. I think you without speaking, mm -hmm. gave a look that indicated that you had some thoughts on it. Well, what, what I will say is this. Look, we are at a starting point. Um, again, this is something that has never been done before in the country. And so what I want to call out is that it is not the, the, the process is not um, set, right? It is right. not in mm -hmm. a process that is set in stone. And so what I want to make sure that folks understand is that my hope is that we do continue to assess so that the process can evolve, so that we can get it right. And so if we find that, you know, through this process, it's not yielding the outcomes we desire, mm -hmm. which is ultimately ensuring that we do have the best um, members of law enforcement yeah. continuing to work every day in our communities, then yeah, we need to reevaluate and see if there are some things that need to change. Um, but, but at the end of the day, it's critically important, this goes to Sonia's point, that we remember this is going to be a continuous process. We need to constantly be reevaluating and assessing and making necessary adjustments. And we Can will. I, jump in and ask I mean, I'm yes, a legislator, yes, so obviously I'm going to continue to try to tweak this thing, but we will be continuing to make those edits. It's, it is important. Didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay. Senator. I just want to note that the fact that we're even able to have this discussion, right, the fact that Sarah Betancourt can pull those records mm -hmm. and say, you know, how right. come these disciplinary actions happen, mm -hmm. but there was no decertification yeah. mm -hmm. here, that in and of itself Long is way. a result yes. of this law, yeah. right, that we can have that's that right. transparency and that conversation that more people are participating in. And don't in forget about the right? structural racism pieces on parole, probation, what's happening in our DOCs. There's schools. just so, schools, there's just so many things happening happening other than just hey, decertifying officers. Because mm -hmm. I can tell you, the first 10,000 officers we trained, they had to go back and tell all of those other folks, hey, this thing is real. And so that's going to change the culture as well, that we are literally changing this relationship and it's important that we continue to, to build on that 10,000, 8,000, 6,000, be done in three years, and that's the right way to, to go about it. Given that this is a protracted and very complicated process, I'm wondering if the three of you think the political will is going to be there long term. You said you're going to keep working on this, but I wonder if, for example, you think that your colleagues in the legislature are going to be willing to exercise <laughs> no. the amount of oversight. No, but right? here's, here's okay. what I'm going to tell you. What is Candid. so great, here, here's what I'm going to tell you. What is so great is we did the exact same thing with this, uh, with posts that we did with the with uh, casinos or um, mm -hmm. and what we did with cannabis, right? They run independent. So we learned, or the mistake that was made with probation and, uh, and all of that scandal, that's helped to, to understand that we need to stand these things up separately and by themselves. And so you don't see the legislature, le legislature having the control that we would normally have or used to have mm -hmm. with uh, patronage jobs and things of that nature. Right, right. It, it's going to run by very qualified people. It has been professional, and that is the way to, to set up all these commissions. Yeah. I'm going to give a little pushback on that. Okay. okay. So, yes, we did set it up that way intentionally <laughs> so there would be some independence from the legislature so it wouldn't always hinge on the legislature's political will. But there are always going to be questions that are still going to, you know, we, we need political will in the agencies, yep. but 
for example, right, I was just looking back, reacquainting myself with the law, there's a bit in there that, um, about body cameras, right, this stood up this task force to make draft regulations mm -hmm. for statewide application of how police departments should use, when they should use, what should be the data standards around use of body cameras. And that task force did meet, they made their, you know, proposed yeah. draft regulations, yeah. unclear, uh, yeah. if those regulations have ever been adopted by the relevant state mm. agency or agencies. And it may be that those agencies can do that without legislative um, say-so uh, or you know, a change in statute, um, but we'll need the political will in the executive branch if that's the case. And if it does need a change in law in order to make those regs flow, we will need the political will yeah. back in the legislature. Sorry. And we that, will that won't be a problem for me, Adam. But. And we will continue to need everyday people yep. in neighborhoods across the Commonwealth to be constantly um, engaging with their elected officials to make sure that they are doing what they need to do. You know, I, there is a role absolutely for the legislature to play, an important role, but, um, but, but I do believe, and in my experience, you know, legislators, elected officials move when their constituents call, absolutely, mm -hmm. um, and 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 they know that their constituents are watching, and so we are all, um, as residents of the Commonwealth, we all have a role to play in ensuring that this work continues to move forward. The other piece, Adam, before we close, I do want to make sure I say is that you know this should also not be seen as kind of a you know pro and pro-law enforcement versus anti-law enforcement mm -hmm. conversation. Um, this is really about the safety, security, and well-being of our communities. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, in that, we all have a role to play and um, in ensuring that both community voice and law enforcement voice are heard is an important part of that. Well, that's a great note to end on. And I remember when Boston's new police commissioner was sworn in, he clearly was frustrated that the community had the, the level of doubt and concern about police being good actors that the community did. And I remember him basically pleading, saying, give us, we need you to work with us. You know, remember that we're humans. And I would think that this process could be a big part of sending that reminder. Tanisha Sullivan, Sonia Chang Diaz, and Russell Holmes, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. That's it for tonight, but do come back next week. And in the meantime, please tell us what you think. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website is gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics. Or find me on Twitter at Riley Adam. For now, thanks for watching and good night.